Belarus's exiled opposition leader says the regime is frightened over the unity of the European Union and other Western nations. A statement comes after the EU, the UK, the US and Canada on Monday imposed sanctions on over 80 Belarusian officials and organizations. The sanctions are in response to Belarus diverting a Ryanair flight and arresting a dissident journalist last month. Svetlana Tikhonovska called the moves a panicked miscalculation by the country's authoritarian president, Alexander Lukashenko. She said the regime stopped thinking strategically, they started to think emotionally. And in other news, a German industry head says the country needs an honest discussion about how to deal with trading partners such as China, adding if red lines on human rights are crossed. Our foreign affairs correspondent Sharon Xu brings us the details. In a speech at an industry event, the president of the Federation of German Industry said Europe and Western countries needed to adopt a confident approach towards difficult customers and competitors, such as China and Russia. Siegfried Rusfum said an honest discussion is needed about how to deal with autocratic trading partners, and clear boundaries must be set. Europe as a whole needs a self-assured approach to our dealings with these difficult clients and competitors. We advocate responsible coexistence and cooperation with clear boundaries. He welcomed a move by the group of seven richest democracies to stand up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. We cannot shy away from confrontation if red lines are crossed. Universal human rights, for example, are not an internal affair. And it is right and overdue that the G7 states have decided to go against China's Silk Road strategy. G7 leaders have proposed a global infrastructure investment plan called Build Back Better to counter the Chinese Communist Party's influence. The Federation of German Industries, or BDI, speaks for 40 trade associations and more than 100,000 enterprises, with around 8 million employees. Sharon Xu, NTD News. Thank you, Sharon. European antitrust regulators opened a new investigation this week into Google. They want to know whether its digital advertising business gives it an unfair advantage over smaller rivals and other advertisers. The European Commission said it would investigate if Google stifles competition by making use of user data for ads on websites and apps while restricting third-party access to this data. Google generated £105 billion in revenue from online ads last year. That's more than any other company in the world. Advertisers and rivals claim that Google plays a role in so many facets of the market, it's impossible to avoid. But Google says thousands of European businesses use its ad products because they're competitive and effective. And in other news, YouTube has won a copyright case in Europe's top court. The court says YouTube isn't responsible for users uploading unauthorized content. NTD's Patrick Hayden brings us this report. Google's YouTube has scored a copyright infringement win in Europe's top court. The court says online platforms are not responsible for uploads that breach copyright. That's unless YouTube fails to quickly block or remove access to the content. Europe's $1 trillion creative industry has a long-running battle with online platforms. They wanted redress for users uploading their copyrighted content without consent. A German music producer sued YouTube in 2008 for hosting unauthorized works of his. And another publisher, Elsevier, sued file hosting service Kyando in 2013 for the same reason. The EU Court of Justice ruled on both cases Tuesday. 
EU regulators are targeting tough new rules that could come into place next year for online platforms that would determine what social media responsibilities are, including how they should police the posting of unauthorised, illegal or hateful content. Patrick Hayden, NTD News, London. The 2020 Tokyo Olympics are almost here. They'll begin on 23rd of July after a year-long delay. On Sunday, Japan unveiled its Olympic Village, adapted for increased safety amid pandemic concerns. Dense high-rises tower over the world's largest metropolis. The Tokyo Olympic Village has formed a city within a city. On Sunday, organizers there gave the media a window into the area, showing off what the athletes' village looks like inside, ahead of the Games. I have experienced staying in the athletes' village a total of 11 times, seven times as an athlete and four times as a team leader. But without a doubt, the athletes' village for these Tokyo Games is the best for me. The plaza draws on the aesthetic style of Japanese minimalist design, in keeping with the Tokyo 2020 theme of using timber in venue construction. More than 60 Japanese cities donated 40,000 pieces of recyclable wood, each marked with the name of its donor city. The plaza offers an ATM machine, dry cleaners, post office, bank and courier. Next to it, the apartment complex is home to shops, a park and a school. It will house over 11,000 athletes in 23 buildings. Built on reclaimed land, the complex will be converted into apartment housing after the event. Initially, athletes were expected to eat in huge dining halls, the largest capable of seating 4,500 people. But now due to social distancing, they will be dining alone. While some remain concerned about the pandemic, organizers are working to minimize the risk of an outbreak. We would like to make our utmost effort into making the athletes' village a truly relaxing and cozy place. And I hope we can share our knowledge so we can be a guide to future Olympics under a pandemic. Athletes will take shuttles in and out of the village and follow complex virus testing rules for safety. Face masks are mandatory, except when outdoors, sleeping or eating. Queen Mary Antoinette's garden in Versailles was recently restored. The aroma of this secluded spot inspired her to create a signature floral perfume. And today's David Vivez is on the scent. Versailles in bloom. Summer is a perfect time to visit the castle gardens, one of which is now restored. This place was built for Queen Marie Antoinette to have somewhere secluded to walk away from the noise of the castle and the king's court. Queen Marie Antoinette managed the creation of this landscape garden. She got the best botanists and agronomists and used trees coming from North America. Veronique Siampini knows every inch of this garden. She oversaw its restoration, which included bringing back all plants, flowers and trees of the time. This tulip tree from Virginia resists all storms. The Queen chose it for its magnificent flowers. It is here that the Queen got the inspiration to create floral perfume for women, something that did not exist at the time. The Queen loved flowers. The colors she preferred were the white, powdered rose and apricotones. Some of the flowers and trees were chosen for their perfume. This garden was completely designed as a piece of art. The king's gardener set the rules for pretty much everything here. The shape of the trees, the size of the leaves, the different flower colors, and the moment when they bloom, even the different tones of green. According to Siampini, the garden is crafted following French traditions. It offers little surprises to whoever walks along the way and also shows a taste for symmetry and balance in the placement of the plants. The garden reopened along with the castle, and both are welcoming the first summer visitors who can enjoy a calm castle before most tourists start coming back. David Dives, NTD News, Paris. That's the news for today, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees. Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on channel 271. In the meantime though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.